So my name is Elena and I have an invisible disability. You don't know it by looking at me, but I am on the autism spectrum. I have what they used to call Asperger syndrome before they lumped a whole bunch of things into autism spectrum disorder under what's called the DSM-5, which is the psychology Bible. And I have a picture of some of my family on, up here. I wish I could claim those two cuties. They're my nieces, not my daughters. I unfortunately don't have a picture that also has my brother and my sister-in-law in it, but I do love them too, I promise. And then I also have a picture of people that I work with up here. My boss is not in this picture, but these are wonderful students in his lab. I'm his lab manager. And I have that up there because a lot of times when people think of people who have autism, they think of the ones who live with their parents for their entire lives, and if they have jobs, it's really simple things. And not all of us are like that. I live on my own, although my parents have recently moved up to Gainesville, and it's wonderful to have them nearby and serving in my church. And I actually have a PhD. So we didn't figure out I had autism until I was in graduate school, partly because I'm an introvert and growing up I was really shy, so I was quiet and I did what I was told. And I didn't have any problems as far as learning. I don't have any major learning disabilities. I think I might have a little bit of dyslexia, but that's about it. So I didn't really have any issues in school other than some attention issues, so I was misdiagnosed with ADD when I was like seven years old, which was a horrible experience because they dragged me out of my classroom without telling my parents oh my to God. the school psycho psychologist's office or counselors and wow. tested me and it was very traumatic. I've had healing about that. <laughs> it was awful. It made my parents very upset. Mm -hmm. So that was my introduction to having an, an invisible disability. When I was a master's student, ironically enough, I was part of a wonderful student ministry and that first year I went through some wonderful programs including Alpha, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that, that prepared me to go to my first healing conference where I experienced inner healing, deeply experienced the Lord's love and was really excited about church and I was freed from a lot of fear so all of a sudden I had a voice and I didn't know how to use it properly and so I ended up getting in a lot of trouble and getting really hurt and then I'd go back to healing conferences and get healing and the Lord brought lots of good at it but it was not a pleasant process. So why is autism such an issue especially in the church? Well it's different for all of us so you really have to establish a relationship with people in your churches who are on the spectrum or who have other disabilities and get to know their stories to really work with them. I'm hoping sharing a little bit about mine will make you more comfortable talking to people on the spectrum and their families and give you a little bit of insight. So there are two big issues. One is communication and the other is what I call the overstimulation problem. So. When Father Bob talks about deaf church, he talks about them being their own language culture. It's not quite like that with autism, but we have a big language barrier, and some people on the spectrum are nonverbal. And so that really is almost a culture in and of itself that we still are working on figuring out how to communicate with, and it can be very challenging. I clearly am very verbal, as you can tell, <laughs> but I still struggle with communication. My native language, if you will, is blunt honesty, which can come off to most people just sounding rude. I struggle with interpreting tone of voice and with expressing my own properly. So when I'm tired and stressed out, I can sound like I'm really angry or upset when I'm just tired. And I can be very literal. Now that's an area I've learned a lot, but when I hear a new expression that I don't know what it means, or when there is someone who is, try, who is humorous, sometimes the only reason I know they've told a joke is because the rest of the room laughs. Sometimes the humor I can recognize, other goes over my head. So that can create communication issues that can create painful experiences and misunderstandings. In the church setting itself, especially the services, there is 
what I have called the overstimulation problem. And it's actually very similar if, to what little kids experience and essentially a lot of us on the spectrum never grow out of it. We process everything that's going on. This actually is a really nice room. There's a nice blank wall back there with just a TV so I don't have all these pictures I'm staring at. I can't hear any of the other rooms that are, where people are presenting, which we had a problem with that at New Wineskins. <laughs> Room next door started playing a video really loudly just as I'm starting my talk. It was like the perfect demonstration <laughs> of a non-sensory safe space. So this is actually a nice room for this. And it's narrow, so it's easy for me to look at all of you also. And I can't turn it off. And so multiple conversations th at the same time is a night for, for me. This lunchroom here I don't like. I will probably eat lunch and then have to leave and go take a walk because it is so loud in there. But that's not uncommon. And within a service, there's a lot going on, and I notice everything, and I can't turn it off. And I also have sensory processing disorder, which is really common. And my biggest issue is sound. And a lot of people who aren't on the spectrum tend to like things just a little bit louder than where my little line of tolerance is. <laughs> and then my second biggest issue is with smell. And lots of people in the church like to wear perfumes and cologne. I was actually really grateful that Bishop Alex asked them not to use incense at the service last night. Mm -hmm. I love the symbolism of it, but not only does the smell bother me, I'm allergic to it. <laughs> so I have all that going on. And to deal with it, I can become like this boiling tea kettle. And then you throw an unexpected change at me or something else. And then the steam has to come out some way. And some of those behaviors to deal with that can be disruptive. The two biggies are verbalizing, which is expressing my thoughts out loud, often with little to no conscious control. I was doing that this morning during the talks because that was really hard for me to listen to all those talks in a row. Thankfully, I had my dad next to me and I was surrounded by people from Servants of Christ who all know I have this issue and I don't think any of the comments were negative. I was just processing everything because that was really all fabulous this morning, quite frankly. And then my other issue that is much more disruptive is venting. And that's exactly what it sounds. And it usually is focused on whatever that last thing is. So the straw that broke the camel's back. And often at clergy or leadership because whatever it is is the fault of whoever's leading. Not really, but that's what it feels like at the time. And then I can end up in the full-blown meltdown, which is exactly what it sounds like, only the adult version of it. And mine involves tears, <coughs> being loud, and those other behaviors I described at the extreme. And it is, to say the least, unpleasant to deal with for other people. And for me, when it happens in public, it's humiliating. I don't like acting like a five-year-old. <coughs> and once I come out of it, it is really embarrassing, and I want to go crawl in a hole somewhere. And the church's reaction to this is often hurtful and makes things worse. I've been called childish, unchristlike, a bad witness, a bad example of whatever ministry I'm a part of, and other hurtful things I won't repeat because I've had healing and forgiven those people and I'm not going to dig it back up again. And this leads to me feeling like a problem and then people trying to help me in ways of, oh, you just need to learn to control this behavior. Well, that doesn't work. I can't do that. Not all the time. And I eventually fail spectacularly. And I have gotten to the point in places of just feeling like a burden. And don't imagine any of you would want to be somewhere where you feel like you're a burden, especially to the leadership who have so much to do anyway. Which leads me to the solution to this problem, which is belonging. And Eric Carter, who's like a guru of disability ministry, defines belonging as being valued and being missed when you're not there. And I have that at Servants of Christ now, and it really is quite wonderful. When I miss a Sunday, I have people who ask me where I was, and they gen generally care and want to know, not the obnoxious version of that. And that I really like. And for me, there are two very important pieces of belonging, being accepted as, as I am and ministering together. And I wrote them in a way that it really f fits anyone. 
So what that means for me, well, the first thing is that being accepted as I am means that it has to be okay that I have autism. I'm going to be this way unless the Lord heals me. And I really am looking forward to my glorified resurrection body that does not have autism. I don't believe the Lord created me this way. But he can use me. And that's the important point. I don't have to be healed of the disability to be his servant and to be his daughter. And so I, I need people, and I have a lot of people at Servants who understand that I have autism. These are the behaviors that come from that, and that doesn't mean that I need to take a break from a ministry. I've had people respond that way, and it's actually really hurtful because it feels like I'm being punished for my behaviors, as opposed to, because they're reacting to me as if I'm a super stressed out adult instead of I'm just having an autism moment over whatever this is that I will eventually work through. And now that's not to say that if I'm not having issues frequently, there aren't people who I trust who might come to me and say, hey, this has been happening a, happening a lot re recently. Is there something going on? Can we pray for you? But that requires the relationship. That's not just anyone who can come up to me and say that. And that, I think, really is a key point we all would like to drive home as a huge key to all of this is relationship. Build relationships with the people who have disabilities and with their families and understand their needs. And don't assume. Assumptions are not good. And then the second thing that's important is ministering together. So many times, especially for people like Jody, everyone wants to minister to us. And yes, of course we need ministry. But we also have gifts and we can be empowered by the Holy Spirit just like the rest of you to serve the Lord and to minister to others. And ministering together is wonderful. I had the fabulous experience of getting to be Bishop Alex's acolyte when he was consecrated a few months ago. And it was quite wonderful. And the vergers and the acolyte master and even the acolytes who worked with me really created an environment of belonging. I felt welcomed and I felt like I was a part of their team even though I was kind of like the little country mouse in this big city church. <laughs> I was trained as an acolyte in a fairly high Episcopal church, but not in a cathedral, which is a whole other level. <laughs> Though there are vergers that tell everyone what to do, which is fabulous. And so that was awesome. I got to acolyte at my mom's ordination in the priesthood, which was wonderful. And I love being an acolyte because being welcomed in that sacred space is very powerful for me. Not only having a disability, but also as a woman. It really hasn't been that long since we've been welcomed up there. My mom grew up in a Catholic church where they had altar boys. <laughs> I think the Catholic church lets girls do that now. And the other thing that I love is praying, so that's why I wore my Order of St. Luke the Physician medallion, or we call ourselves OSL for short because it's a mouthful. And we had our national conference a couple weeks ago, and it was a fabulous example of ministering together. We had clergy at all levels because the chaplain to the board is bishop by the name of Ron Kuykendall, who is wonderful. Ministering together with lay people, my prayer partner was a priest, and we would minister to other lay people and to priests. And now we were all vetted prayer ministers. This isn't just everyone at the conference, but on the prayer team and the intercessory team. Those are two different related ministries, which is a whole other conversation I would love to have if you're interested. And <coughs> It was just really wonderful getting to do both of those things. I was even Bishop Ron's intercessor for his workshop talk and I got to pray for him leading up to the conference and then in person before his talk and then when he was done I went up for prayer. That was just the way it was that weekend and it was a fabulous example of belonging even through the service where Mother Sharon invited all of the clergy to come up together during communion and this is tech ACNA and other splits all ministering together at an OSL conference. It was amazing and brought tears to my eyes. So an amazing example of belonging. So.